Well, I want to thank you and thank Penny. She's done a fantastic job, and I just got to meet a lot of your leadership, and they're incredible people. Thank you very much. It's an honor to be here, a tremendous honor, and to address one of the most legendary groups in American politics. That's what you've become, and that's a very big uh, statement. The Concerned Women for America, a very big statement. I was proud to be the very first candidate to sign your presidential pledge. That was a pledge that was very easy to sign. It took me about 30 seconds. I read quickly. I look at it. I say, I'm going to do that. You think Joe Biden would? First of all, he couldn't read it. He wouldn't know. What does this mean? Now, I looked at it very quickly, and I said, that's perfect. Uh, but it's a pledge. It is a pledge, vowing to defend the dignity of women and affirming the ultimate truth that all women are female. Can you imagine if you said that 10 years ago? People would say, what the hell does he mean by that? Of course, that's it's incredible what's uh, happened to our country and to the world to a large extent. But what's happened to our country, at last think of it, all women are female, and I have to make that statement. <laughs> Shouldn't be necessary, should it? As another statement, we say, uh, we will not allow the mutilation of our children. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? No, but can you imagine making that statement 10, 15 years ago? People would say, of course you're not going to do that. But now you have to stop it. It's crazy what's going on, but uh, it's just one of those things. This world is changing, our country is changing, and a lot of the world is changing because of our country. Our country is in very, very serious bad shape, really bad shape. I want to express my profound appreciation to uh, the true leader and uh, of all of the — I mean, the people here are so incredible whether it's Penny Nance or whether it's all of these incredible people sitting at these tables that I just met for the first time, and that you're out here on a beautiful evening in Washington. Washington, as you know, has some very serious problems with crime, with, with muggings and killings and fights and a lot of problems. And we're going to do something about Washington. We're going to bring in the federal government. We're going to federalize it. We're going to run it properly, clean it, make it safe. It's got to be safe for people to come to. And uh, people want to see a safe city. It's very sad. When I uh, come in, we had, a, we had a situation that was a lot different just three years ago. And now you come in, and you hear the stats, and you hear all of the things that are going on, and you see the graffiti all over beautiful marble walls. It's not removed. And you see parks that are occupied by people that aren't supposed to be there. It's a very sad thing when I see it, but we're going to straighten that out, too, along with a lot of other things. One year from now, each of you will vote in the most important election of your lifetimes. This election will decide whether America will be ruled by Marxist, fascist, and communist tyrants who want to smash our Judeo-Christian heritage, or whether America will be saved by God-fearing, freedom-loving patriots just like you, just like you. And that's what you are. If we stand together in this fight, we're going to defeat crooked Joe Biden. And he is crooked as hell, isn't he, though? It's unbelievable. <laughs> he didn't do anything wrong. How about the quid pro quo? We're not giving you the billion dollars unless you get rid of the prosecutor. How about if I said that? That's called the real quid pro quo. But we're going to take back our country. We're going to take back our culture. And we're going to make America great again, greater than ever before. Let me get it done, too. But just think of what we've already achieved with the help of uh, many people, just like the people in this room. We did more to uphold religious liberty than any administration in history. I think everybody really admits that. Even my opponents uh, today, two of them came out and they said, well, that happens to be right. Actually, one of my opponents said that I was the greatest president in the last hundred years. And I said, oh, is he running against me? That's very nice. <laughs> no, it's very nice. Look, they respect what we've done. I fearlessly protected the religious freedoms of doctors, nurses, teachers, and faith groups like the Little Sisters of the Poor. I blocked the IRS from using the Johnson Amendment to interfere with pastors' freedom of speech and other faith leaders. I stopped. Barack Hussein Obama's hateful, bigoted assault on faith-based adoption and foster care services, as you know. And I restored your right to help those beautiful children find a loving and equally beautiful family. 
As president, I stood proudly with our friend and ally, the State of Israel. I kept my promise, recognized Israel's eternal capital, and opened the American Embassy in Jerusalem. Even got it built. I got the embassy built. Can you believe that? Would have taken — would have taken 20 years, you wouldn't have had an embassy. That was an interesting one. I said, do we have any land? You know, they want to spend $2 billion to build it. We spent slightly less than that, like $500,000, got it built. I said, do you have any buildings around? You know, we were always first, like, you know, whether — you always try and do — if you want a real building, you always try and get the post office, because they were there early. I happened to do that in Washington, D.C., actually. We redid it and did very well. It's been a great success. It's been a really beautiful building. But uh, I said, let's get it built. Let's get it built. So they came to me. They wanted to spend $2 billion. I said, well, maybe we have land that's a better location. They had a piece of land, but it was a bad location. The real estate people, two of them in the back that are friends of mine, they're very good real estate people, too. They know what I'm talking about. So they went out, they checked. They called me up two days later. They said, you know, we do have a great piece of land, and it has a building on it. I said, that's even better, because you can renovate the building for a lot less than it costs to build a brand new one. A lot of people don't know that. So. I put a crew on it. I said, how much can we do? Can we build it great? They said, sir, we can do it for $350,000. And it's the first time I think this ever happened to me, my, like in my entire life. I said, that sounds too low. <laughs> how the hell can you do it for that? It sounds too low. And anyway, so we got it done. We did it for a little bit more, we used Jerusalem stone. Everyone talks about Jerusalem stone in New York. They love Jerusalem stone. It's very expensive. I said, can we use Jerusalem stone? Because we're in Jerusalem, right? They said, yeah. I said, it's very expensive. They said, no, we're in Jerusalem. You know, for <laughs> I have a friend, he, he thinks it's the most magnificent stone, and he's willing to pay anything for it. So we did the whole thing in Jerusalem stone. We got it done for less than $500,000. We opened the embassy, not only designated, but we opened it. And we saved almost $2 billion. Think of that. And the $2 billion wouldn't have been spent. That building wouldn't have been built for 20 years. But we got it opened very quickly, and it's really beautiful. And there's no reason, in my opinion, to ever redo it. But someday they'll knock it down and spend $2 billion or much more. But I also recognized Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights, something that was going on for 58 years. I got it done. We got it done quickly, and I withdrew the United States from the dis totally disastrous Iran nuclear deal. Unfortunately, this administration hasn't done a damn thing about it. They've let, they've let that just go on and on and on. And then they made a deal, as you know, for five hostages. I said, all right, that sounds okay. Five hostages. They had five. We had five. That sounds okay. But they forgot to tell me one thing. In addition to the hostages, they get $6 billion. You know that deal? You heard about that deal? That's not a good deal. That's not. What are they doing? It's a five for five. They said it's a five for five split. Plus, they get $6 billion. Oh, that doesn't sound too good. But that's what happens with this country. I've never seen anything like it, whether it was trade deals or any other kind of deal. It always seems that we get the short end. We traded. We did such a job on trade. We redid trade deals at a level that nobody's ever seen before and took bad deals like NAFTA, and we made them great deals, the USMCA. That's United States, Mexico, Canada. We did an incredible trade deal with China that I don't even talk about. They buy $50 billion worth of our farm product and manufactured product, but I don't even talk about it because of what happened with COVID. But South Korea, we did incredible deals. Japan, we did incredible deals. We took deals that were horrible and made them good. And we did a lot of things. We did a lot of things. We've been given, actually, a lot of credit, even by the fake news. But here at home, we totally transformed the federal judiciary. And as Penny said, I heard her opening remarks, and she said uh, we appointed nearly 300 judges, really brilliant judges, and they interpret the law as written. Constitution, it's, uh, we like to say, the Constitution as written. That's the way they interpret. Together, we withstood vicious attacks to confirm three great Supreme Court justices, Neil Gorsuch, Brett Kavanaugh, and Amy Coney Barrett. Really good people, too. And I'm also proud to be the most pro-life president in American history. Very important. We're going to talk about that in 
Just a second. From my first day in office, I took action to protect the unborn. I reinstated the Mexico City policy, stopped taxpayer funding for the abortion of industrial complex. And at the United Nations, I made clear that global bureaucrats have no business attacking the sovereignty of nations that protect innocent life. They have no business doing that. And I was the first sitting president ever to attend, as Penny also mentioned, the March for Life rally right here in Washington, D.C. They talked about attending it. You know, presidents for years talked about attending. Oh, I'm going to go. I'm going to go. And then it happened that they didn't go. And uh, none of them went. None of them. But I went. And it was a beautiful day. One year ago, in a victory that conservatives had been seeking for 50 years, 50 years they've been fighting for this, those same Supreme Court justices and the Supreme Court ruled to end the moral and constitutional atrocity known as Roe v. Wade. Very important. Nobody thought that could be done. And so important, and it's, it's not discussed right, it's not talked about right. To be honest, Republicans don't know how to discuss the subject, but they're the radicals, not us. The Democrats are the radicals. So now pro-lifers have a tremendous power to negotiate. You had no power whatsoever. There wasn't a thing you could do. But now you have tremendous power to negotiate, which they didn't have before the ruling. This moves the issue back to the states. Everybody wanted it to go back to the states. All legal scholars on both sides, they wanted it back to the states where it should be. Like President Ronald Reagan before me, I support the three exceptions for rape, incest, and the life of the mother. And I think it's very hard politically if you don't support, but you have to go with your heart. You have to go with what you believe, and you have to rely on your heart for that. But I, I do support the exceptions. Ronald Reagan did, and many others do. And uh, I think if you don't, it's, it's politically very difficult. But again, you have to go with what you feel. Remember, the Democrats are the radicals on an issue like this. This is a very important issue, but they're very radical because they're willing to kill babies in their fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth month, and even after birth. You know, they kill babies after birth. You remember the uh, governor? I call him Michael Jackson, remember? He's a big fan of Michael. He was going to almost do the uh, moonwalk, and then his wife stopped him. She did a great thing. It's probably the greatest contribution ever made to him. But he uh, talked about the baby's born, and then we'll discuss with the mother what to do with the baby. This is the baby is born. And uh, these are extremists, not us. They're the extremists. The, the politicians and the people that have this issue, they fought for 50 years to get it, and they have to know how to talk about it because they're not talking about it correctly. And uh, when they do talk about it correctly, it's an issue that really uh, can be positive, because we do have to hold on to office. We do have to win. And we can win elections on this issue, but it's very delicate, and explaining it properly is an extremely important thing. You have to be able to speak and explain it properly. And a lot of politicians who are pro-life do not know how to discuss this topic, and they lose their election. We had a lot of election losses because of this, because they didn't know how to discuss it. They had no idea. I heard some of the people discussing it, and they didn't — they just didn't have a clue. And we can't let that happen. It's an incredible thing. And uh, we gave them this unbelievable power to negotiate a great deal. And remember, before the termination of Roe v. Wade, they had no power and you had no rights. No rights. And done properly, our nation after 52 years, can finally come together. This has been a rough issue for our country for many, many years. And you can come together, and you can have victory. But you can come together, but you have to be able to uh, discuss it properly, because it's so — it's so bad when I listen to people talking about it. They don't know what to say. They feel it. They want it. They love it. And from a religious standpoint, they love it so much, but they don't know how to talk about it. Another the great victory for our movement last year, the Supreme Court issued a landmark decision protecting a thing called school prayer. That's pretty big, right? And just months ago, and this is one that people were 
very impressed with. The justices also ruled to move our country forward with a merit-based system of education. Now, who thought that was going to happen? In other words, if you get all A's, you get in. If you don't get all A's and boards and whatever it is to get in, you just, uh, you know, they were having other people come in with marks that were very, very inferior. And now they went, think of it, we're back to a merit-based. This country is about merit-based, and we're back to a merit-based system. And I think that one got people by surprise that that's happened. But we're going to have a great country. We're going to have to base success on merit, not other things. And I think that was an amazing — I frankly think that was an amazing decision. But it's no wonder the far-left lunatics, perverts, and criminals are getting desperate to stop our movement by any means necessary. They are really trying to stop us, as you perhaps have read. <laughs> it's all they're good at. They're bad at policy. They have no idea what they're doing. They have open borders. They have no voter ID. They don't want voter ID. I saw on the television one of these characters, there shouldn't be voter ID. You know, you have voter ID to buy a loaf of bread. You have, you have ID to buy a loaf of bread. You have everything. You have pictures. When they had their Democrat National Convention, they had a picture of the biggest thing I've ever seen. They had fingerprints. They had everything you could possibly know about that person. That was to get into their room with thousands of people. They had — it was like a billboard. It was actually very much like my mugshot, if you want to know the truth. <laughs> Thinking about it just right now. Big. But for voting, the most important thing for voting, there'll be no voter ID. And this guy was trying to explain why. There's only one reason they don't want voter ID, because they want to cheat. That's the only reason. There's no, there's no second reason. And that's all they're good at. As you know, crooked Joe Biden and his radical left thugs have weaponized law enforcement to arrest their leading opponent by a lot leading. And phony charges. It's a phony deal. This is high-level election interference, and it's happening for a single reason, because I'm the one candidate that they do not want to run against. You know, they always go out, Yo, we really want to run against Trump. If they wanted to run against me, I wouldn't be in courts all over the land fighting these maniacs off. They don't want to run. And if you look at today's polls that just came out, I'm leading Biden in just about all of them, and in some cases leading him by a lot. No, they don't want to run against me, but they say, you know, very smart. They're good. They're misinformation people. Disinformation and or misinformation. A lot of people don't know the difference. There's a very little difference, but we'll say it's both. Disinformation, misinformation. They say, yeah, we want to run against Trump. We're dying to run against him. First of all, we won in 2016. Same people said, he won't be able to beat Hillary Clinton. Now they say, he won't be able to beat crooked Joe Biden. Well, he — you know, I took the word away from Hillary, right? We call her now Beautiful Hillary. She's a beautiful woman. I took it away because it was so good, and it fit Joe Biden so well. But I don't like having a name the same for two people. So that was a great day for Hillary, because after five years, I stopped calling her crooked. So now I don't know what to call her, so I just call her beautiful. She's a beautiful woman. But he's crooked as hell. But just today, Fox, has me up by almost 50 points on the sanctimonious and beating Biden. 50 points. And Harvard Harris, just as I'm walking on the stage, he just came out with a very similar poll, up by numbers that people, frankly, haven't seen before. And a lot of it's, you know, a lot of times they say, well, they don't like Trump, but they love his policy. No, I think they like me, too, you know? <laughs> You can't get elected if they don't like you. I mean, the policy is very important, but if they don't like you. But they always say, they don't like him, but they like his policy. That's why he has these good numbers, you know. But I, I love you, and I hope you love me. But we fight hard for you. But all polls are bearing this out, these big numbers. I mean, every one of them. I haven't seen one that's uh, even slightly negative. It's driving a lot of people crazy. Oh, CNN's gone crazy. MSDNC has gone absolutely crazy. They don't want to talk about it. But on De Sanctimonious, as you know, I got him elected, but now he's a failed candidate. He failed. He failed before. You know, he came in, I gave him an endorsement, and we lifted him into victory. He was way, way behind. It was, it was over. The race was over. I endorsed him, and he went like a rocket ship, and he won very shortly thereafter. And then uh, I got him past the elections. I got him the nomination. Then I got him the election. He ran against a guy at the time 
who was uh, — turned out to be a crackhead, but nobody knew that at the time. <laughs> At the time, he was uh, the hottest, one of the hottest guys. He was probably the hottest man in the Democrat Party, and Stacey Abrams was the hottest woman in the Democrat Party. He was going to be this at the governor of Florida. He couldn't stop him. Ron DeSanctimonious said, oh, I don't think we can beat him. I don't think we can beat him, because he was. I mean, if you remember back, and uh, I said, you beat him. And we did two or three giant rallies. We had unbelievable rallies, Trump rallies for him. And then uh, he wins. And then four years later, somebody shouted out, will you run against the president? And he said, I have no comment. He said, he said he had no comment. That guy's going to run against me. And I started hitting him. And they all said, sir, he's a Republican. You shouldn't hit him so hard. I said, like hell, I shouldn't. And he went down like, like an injured bird out of the sky. And I'm actually quite happy about that. You know, a lot of the people, a lot of people say, uh, loyalty means nothing in politics, sir. You shouldn't mention it. You're wasting your time. I have genius consultants back there. You know, they get paid a lot of money. They say, sir, loyalty. They actually change their mind now because they see what happened. I said, no, I think loyalty is very important for people. They said, well, in politics, it means nothing. I said, maybe you'll be surprised. But I assume it did. You know, when I get somebody in office and then they turn around, they, I didn't even, I hardly spoke to the guy, hardly knew him during that period of years. But any time Florida had problems, a statement that essentially said he was going to run. And so we hit him hard. And he's really, uh, in fact, in South Carolina, he's right now in fourth place. He's in fourth place. And I'm leading the second place by 35 points. You know, they have uh, two people. You have a senator and you have a governor in South Carolina. They thought they were going to do well there. And they're not doing so well. That's a great state for us. Uh, and I think uh, we have a lot of people here right now. And I just met a couple backstage from South Carolina. It's great. But we're leading by a lot there. We're leading by a lot everywhere. And a lot of it's because they do like me. But a lot of it's also because there has never been a more incompetent administration in the history of our country than these clowns and thugs and very bad people that are running our country now and destroying our country. There's never been anything like this. But most importantly, far and away, uh, I'm beating Biden by a lot. If I wasn't running, or if I was in third, fourth, or fifth place, or something in that category, none of this interference would have ever happened. None of this horrible uh, stuff with uh, U.S. attorneys and the FBI and DOJ. Oh, we're in a banana republic right now. <laughs> Think of it. We did great. We won in 2016. People said we wouldn't win. We won. We won big. We did much better in 2020. You know, we got millions and millions more votes, many millions of more votes. We did something very few presidents do. Usually, they get less votes the second time. People get bored. They get tired of them, like we're tired of this guy. And uh, but we're tired of him for different reasons, not out of boredom. It's just out of — actually, he's very exciting, because you don't know when he's going to just pop off and explode. <laughs> You're watching everybody standing on eggs. You say, did he just say that? Did you see him yesterday? It's just not even believable what's going on. I don't know. It's hard to believe he's going to be running. Hard to believe he's going to get to the gate. I don't think he will. But if he does, he does. If he does, he does, whatever. But whether it's him or somebody else, we have no choice. We have to win. Because their, their views are, are just absolutely horrible, and we're going to be better than any other election we've ever had. We're going to get the highest. You know, in uh, 2020, I don't know if you know that, the press doesn't like talking about it. We got the most votes in the history of politics for a sitting president. No sitting president, almost 75 million votes. And that's what they say. That's not including the other votes that they didn't, they forgot about. But we got the most votes in the history of politics. I was told if we could get, we got 63 million and we won. And I was told that if we got 63 million, we couldn't lose by the best pollsters. And we got about 12 million more votes than that. And they say we lost. You know, it's horrible. So they rigged the presidential election in 2020, and we're not going to allow them to rig the presidential election of 2024. We're going to bring our country back. Every time the radical left Democrats, Marxists and communists and fascists indict me, I consider it a great badge of honor. I really do. <laughs> because in a true sense, I'm being indicted for you. Thanks a lot, everybody. I appreciate it.
I appreciate that. And did you see today that deranged Jack Smith, he's the prosecutor, he's a deranged person, wants to take away my rights uh, under the First Amendment, wants to take away my right of speaking freely and openly. Never forget, our enemies want to stop us because we are the only ones that can stop them. They want to take away my freedom because I will never let them take away your freedom. I'm standing here. Standing here, I am that, in another sense, I'm that wall. We built a very successful wall. You know, they like to say, we only built 50 miles. We built almost 500 miles of wall. These people are sick. They want to silence me because I will never let them silence you, never. And in the end, they're not after me, they're after you. I just happen to be standing in their way. Unfortunately for me, but you're lucky. But here's just some of what we will do when we become and I say we become, because we're going to become the 47th President of the United States. As soon as we get back in the White House, I will totally obliterate the deep state. And we started, and we're doing a great job. Then we got hit with the COVID. We fired Comey. We fired a lot of people. Rid of ISIS. Got you the largest tax cuts in history. Got you the largest regulation cuts in history. Had the greatest economy in the history of our country. We were energy independent. Think of it, energy independent. We're going to be energy dominant within months. And then they came along, and now look what's happened to your energy. It's not good. Now they want to go to all electric cars. They don't go far. They cost a lot of money. They got a little, they got some basic problems. They're very expensive, and they don't go far. I think they want to keep you somewhere around your home. They, they don't want to build highways or something. They got some crazy plan. They always have something. You know, they want to build, I don't know if you know, all electric army tanks. Now, we have these army tanks. <laughs> no, it's, I just saw this uh, yesterday. They want to build all electric army tanks. The army tanks, the greatest tanks, the Sherman tank, the greatest tanks in the world we built. So now when we go into obliterate a country with our army tanks, at least we won't pollute it with the <laughs> pollutants pouring out of the back of the tank. And now they also want to go with a certain type of fuel to uh, — it'll cut down about 12 percent on the efficiency of our fighter jets. They want to make our fighter jets uh, very environmentally friendly. So we go into a war. We're over somebody's territory. We're bombing the crap out of them. But at least we're not polluting their air. Do you — are we crazy or what? And the planes — think of this. The planes are 12 percent less efficient. So you got a pilot up there, and he's got some guy on his tail. And he say, what the hell happened to my plane? I used to be able to get out of these situations. This plane is not so good anymore. And they're willing, because they don't want to pollute the air over a country that we're in war with. These are brilliant people doing this. They have, to, they have to want to destroy our country to do this. And how about the truckers? Did you read about the truckers? They want to go all electric trucks. Now, there are a couple of basic problems, uh, but I met with truckers, and they said every year for 50 years, the trucks got better and better and better. We expected we had to pay millions of dollars for trucks, but they got better, better, better. If they do this, we're going to go back 50 or 60 years. For one thing, and I had no idea, some of the big ones with the big tanks, they can go up to 2,000 miles with diesel. Think of that. Two th in other words, you can drive all day, all night, all day, all night, forever. But 2,000 miles. And electric will go, if you're lucky, 300 miles. So they're going to go 300 miles stop for about five hours and <laughs> charge it up. And these guys, I, I don't know, does anybody not sit down? You don't even have to sit down. So they're going to destroy our trucking industry. And right now, it's a regulation, and they're actually serious about it. I actually thought all this stuff with the army tanks and the jets and all the things, I actually thought it was, you know, some kind of a comedy skit. <laughs> but it's not. They really mean it. And they're going to destroy our, you know, destroy our trucking industry. You think you don't get your goods right now? You're going to see. You're going to see some mess. But I will fire every corrupt official who has weaponized our government against Christians, conservatives, patriots, and people of faith. We're going to fire them. You're fired. You remember The Apprentice? I'm sure nobody remembers The Apprentice. You're fired. Get out of here. And you know, that show ran for 12 
years, 12 years. It was a tremendous success. And I said, well, one thing I know when I do this, actually, it was 14 different shows. They actually, it was so good, they put it on one season, they put it on twice. And they said uh, they wanted to renew my contract for a long time. Anything I wanted, they were willing to give, because it was doing great all the time. But I had done it for 12 years. That's a long time, considering I was never in show business before. Right? And it did phenomenal for them. And I said, one thing for certain, NBC is going to treat me so good. They're going to treat me so good, they are so bad. MSNBC and MSDNC, I call it. But they are so bad, but that's all right. But they want to give me a long term. I think that's why they're bad. I wouldn't extend. They gave it to Arnold Schwarzenegger, and that didn't work out too well. That lasted about uh, two minutes. Somebody said, do you want Arnold Schwarzenegger to succeed like never before and even top your ratings, which is almost impossible to do. But would you rather have that and we own the show? Would you rather have that or would you rather have him fail? Because I know what, what the fake news would do if he was successful with it. They'd say, see, Trump didn't do so good. Because look, we got a movie star and he took over. Well, I said, probably I'd rather see him fail, to be honest with you. And he did. He failed. Didn't work out. But The Apprentice was great. But he said, you fired. And I fired a lot of people, but we're going to have to fire a lot more because that deep state runs deeper than we thought. Before I even arrive at the Oval Office, shortly after I win the presidency, I will have the horrible war between Russia and Ukraine settled, and it would have never happened. It would have never, ever happened if I was there. I used to talk to Putin about it. I've said it very openly. I talked to him about it. It was the apple of his eye. I said, don't do it, Vladimir. Don't do it, Vladimir. Oh, you'll be making such a mistake. And I told him a couple of things. He said, you wouldn't do that. I said, yes, I will. No, you wouldn't. And he probably didn't believe me, but he believed me 10%. That's all you needed. But I said, don't do it. As soon as I left, they started to warm, and we saw the handwriting. And then we had the disaster of Afghanistan, which I think was the most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. And the press doesn't even want to talk about it anymore. The most embarrassing moment in the history of our country. And Putin saw that, and China saw that, and they saw that we had a lot of very incompetent people. And uh, it, was, it was a rough time. But we'll get that done. We'll get it done very quickly. As the Bible says, blessed are the peacemakers. You know that, right? Blessed are the peacemakers. I made peace. Remember, Hillary said, he will take us into war. No, I took us out of all these wars. I got us out of Syria. I got us out of Iraq. I protected Israel. They would have been in a big problem. But I'll be your peacemaker, and I am the only candidate who can make this promise. I will prevent World War III. We are very close to World War III. Let me tell you, we are very close to World War III. And World War III will be like no other because of the power of the weaponry. The weaponry we have today is just incredible. And others have, by the way. But I will prevent World War III. And I'll heal our relationship with the state of Israel to reverse the damage that crooked Joe Biden has done. Unlike Biden, I'll not be giving the $6 billion as ransom to countries for five people, five people. I will stop the disaster known as Bidenomics. He thinks it's good. You know, Bidenomics started up being a really bad thing, and they use it as a negative expression, but he liked the sound of it, so now he's trying to promote it as being a wonderful thing. But it really means inflation, taxation, submission, and failure. Other than that, it's quite good. <laughs> Those are four pretty cool things, aren't they? But not if you have to live with it like the people of our country have to do. I will regain energy independence as we had three years ago and achieve energy dominance. You know, we have more liquid gold under, if I call it liquid gold, that's what it is. We have more liquid gold than Saudi Arabia or Russia, than anybody. And we were going to be drilling, and we were drilling, and we were filling up the strategic reserves, which now he's emptied to the lowest level ever, ever. You know that, right? The lowest level ever in order to keep gasoline prices down on people so they'd vote for a Democrat. But uh, artificial, very artificial. Now it's up to $5, I see. Gasoline is up to five, six, seven dollars in some places. It's going up very rapidly. But America was going to have, we're going to make so much money. We're going to that, we're going to sell to Europe, oil and gas, sell it to Europe. And we were going to start paying off our $35 trillion in debt 
And we were going to lower taxes still further. We we're going to do great things. But when they came in, they ended everything. And that's what caused inflation. Energy caused inflation. Now everything's causing inflation. It's a mess. And the numbers came out yesterday that inflation is absolutely not in control. And inflation's a nation killer, by the way. You go back 200 years and 100 years, you look at any nation that's had rampant inflation, they die. Those nations die. America will have the number one lowest cost of energy and electricity anywhere in the world. We'll do that. You know, New England pays the highest in the country. And uh, they uh, — I, I explained to them, I said, you know, we can't get — they can't get a pipe going through upstate New York, where everyone wants it to go through because they want the jobs, because it's really in bad shape. And uh, if that happened, you'd cut it in half immediately. Instead, ships come — many from Russia. Can you believe it? They were all coming from Russia, and they — load it up and they give it to New England, but it's a very expensive. They have the highest prices for energy. They should never vote for a Democrat, I'll tell you that. They do. They tend to, but they should never even think about it. Under, under my and, — and, and you have to see this because we have something incredible, really incredible planned, and some incredible things. But upon my inauguration, I'll terminate every open borders policy of the Biden administration and quickly achieve the most secure border in U.S. history, as we had three years ago. We had the most successful border three years ago. We built nearly 500 miles of border wall. All That's all certified stuff, by the way. You know, they like to say, well, he didn't build the wall. It wasn't easy when you had uh, Paul Rhino. Do you know who Paul Rhino is? Paul Ryan? Paul Rhino, and you had uh, Mitch McConnell. And they fought — they fought so hard. Uh, and I got it anyway. And I got it — I got it done. Then we were going to add 200 more miles, and that was all set to go. And then we had the election situation take place, that horrible situation, horrible day in our — and it's going to go down as that. It'll be a horrible day in our country's history. And because of that, I said, these guys don't want to finish. It would have taken three weeks to put up another 200 miles of wall. It was all there. It was all ready to be assembled. But uh, we got Mexico to give us 28,000 soldiers free of charge. You know, they always say, Mexico, Mexico. Well, Mexico paid fortunes for that. We had 28,000 soldiers free of charge. You know, when they say Mexico didn't pay, Mexico paid much more for that because I needed that. We didn't have to worry about the war. We got that from the military because I considered it an invasion. So I took it out of the military, which is just a small portion of their budget. But I took it out because that was an invasion. But Mexico. We had 28,000 soldiers free of charge, and it wasn't easy to get either. I went to them, and I said, uh, you got to give us 28,000 soldiers to protect us from people pouring through your country. And they smiled at me, and they said, why would we do that? Which is probably what everybody would say. I said, no, you're going to do it. You're going to do it, 100 percent. And the person, a woman, very nice woman, she was actually good, but she never won anything in 25 years from Mexico. But. She worked on Mexico for 25 years. She said, sir, we've been asking for things like that for 25 years. They're never going to give it to you. I said, absolutely, 100 percent. Not 90 percent, not 95, 100 percent. They're going to give it to us. Sir, they won't. And we asked for other things like remain in Mexico and all sorts of things, Title 42. So I said, give me a list of your top 10 things. And they wrote it down. The Border Patrol wrote down things. Border Patrol's great. ICE wrote down things. They're great. These are great patriots. These are tough guys. They all wrote down 10 things. But the big thing was the 28,000 soldiers, I guess you'd say. And uh, the top person from Mexico came in, just right under the president, who's a friend of mine. I mean, he's a great guy. He came in. And I said, you're going to have to give us 28,000 soldiers. No, 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 we will not do that. I said, yes, you will. And he said, no, no, we will not do that. I said, here's the story. It was a Friday evening. I said, on Monday morning at 7 o'clock in the morning, you're going to be paying a tariff or tax of 25 percent of every car. You know, they sold 32 percent of our car industry, just so you know. They send us millions of cars. Of every car and every product from Mexico into the United States, you're going to be paying a tariff. And here are the papers right here. I'm going to sign them now. But it goes in effect 7 o'clock on Monday morning. And he said, uh, may I make a phone call? <laughs> and I said, you may. Came back in five minutes. Sir, it would be our honor to put 28,000 soldiers on the border to protect you from some very bad people.
that are coming in. And you know, Biden gave all that stuff up. He gave up Title 42. That You know what Title 42 was so important? To protect our country and uh, to end the child trafficking crisis by returning all trafficked children to their families and their home countries immediately. <laughs> and you know, Jim Cavazell, who was a big actor, he put it very well in the movie Sound of Freedom. God's children are not for sale. He said that. God's children are not for sale. Good movie. That was a good movie, by the way. And Jim is a wonderful guy. On day one, I will sign a new executive order to cut federal funding for any school pushing critical race theory, transgender insanity, and other inappropriate racial, sexual, or political content on our children. Our children are just being absolutely — I mean, they're being harassed, and they, they're not old enough to know what's right. And, you know, as, as the children, when they do these horrible things to them, and they turn 30 at 35, they look back and they say, who did this to me? Many of them, a big percentage, I think 68 percent. I saw some numbers, 68 percent. Who did this to me? Who did it? Without parental consent, can you believe it? I will insist on the right of every parent to send their child to the public, private, charter, or religious school of their choice. Choice, choice, choice. We want to have choice in schools, and we want to have choice in cars. If we don't want to build a, if we don't want to buy an electric car, and you should be able some people might want an electric car. You know, they want to drive to the drugstore every once in a while, right? <laughs> but if you don't want an electric car, you should be able to use the thing, that beautiful liquid gold that's under our feet. It's called gasoline. <laughs> or hybrids. Hybrids are very good, actually. You know, at least, you, can, you know, you're not going to be stuck. You know, with an electric car, there are lots of feelings engendered by electric cars. The first is when you — one of the best feelings you ever have in life, when you have it fully charged and you're ready to go, and you start on your trip, and for 10 minutes you feel like you're elated. <laughs> then after that, for the next hour and a half, you feel horrible because you're looking for a charger. You're saying, where the hell am I going to get this car charged? But I always say to people about electric cars that if I were in that business, I would immediately open up, because these guys are making a fortune, a tow truck company. Because <laughs> you see these cars, they're being towed all over the place. I would make so much money, uh, but I can't do that. I think that's — is that a conflict with being president? I think so, right? What do you think? Is that a little bit of a conflict? I will close the Federal Department of Education, and we will move everything back to the states where they can individualize education and do it with love for our children. You know, it's — look, every list I look at, we're like in the bottom 2 percent, 5 percent. We're at the bottom. There's a list of 40 that came out. We're number 39. We spend more money per pupil than any country in the world by triple, triple. Uh, Norway is second, and Denmark is third, and China, believe it or not, is right up there, as big as it is. And they have countries that spend a tiny fraction of what we spend, so obviously it's not working. And all those buildings in Washington — I see it, Department of it, the biggest buildings you've ever seen, they're all over the place. Uh, we've got to keep one or two people just to make sure they're teaching English, right? You know, all of a sudden we'll say one, one place happened to go to a different language. We can't let that happen, but we're going to — and the Department of Education, let the states run education. And these states are going to do a great job, many of them. I'll also fight to keep — and this is so important — we'll be able to direct elections and get and pick the school principals by the parents, and these will be the principals of their choice, because right now you have principals in there that hate parents. I mean, I watch this happening. You have principals that absolutely are violent. They hate the parents. They don't want to let the parents even talk to them about the education of their child. If any principal is not getting the job done, the parents should be able to vote to fire them and select someone that they like. <laughs> but that'll ultimately be up to the states. We will have great schools that lead to great jobs and ultimately great lives, because we have horrible schools right now. Our programs are terrible. As much money as we spend, and I'll not give one penny to any school that has a vaccine mandate or a mask mandate. I let it be up to the governors, but we're not going to do that.
And, you know, I always allowed, I allowed the governor. Some did a great job and some didn't do a good job. Uh, you look at uh, Governor Nome of South Dakota, where I just left. She's done a fantastic job. And you look at Henry McMaster, Governor McMaster of South Carolina, did a fantastic job, kept the states open. And some did, some didn't. But the ones that really did horrible jobs were Democrat governors. I think just about every one of them. And uh, we're not going to let it happen. In addition, I'll take historic action to defeat the toxic poison of gender ideology and reassert in the beginning, God created two genders, male and female. Is that all right to say? See, the, the press back there is going to say, we have breaking news. He said there is two genders, male and female, headlines. He is a terrible, terrible thing to say. You know, you have to be very careful. You do these shows and you do everything. You say something that's perfect, you end up in like headlines. Yeah, you know, two genders, male and female. On day one, I will sign an executive order instructing every federal agency cease to cease the promotion of sex or gender transition at any age. They can't do it. They can't do it. The mistakes that are made are so horrific. I will declare that any hospital or healthcare provider that participates in the chemical or physical mutilation of minor youth. Can you believe we say this, right? Can you believe it? No longer meets federal health and safety standards. They will be terminated from receiving federal funds effective immediately. We'll do it immediately. You'd be amazed at how quickly that'll stop. And I will challenge California's depraved new laws that strip parents of parental rights and that encourage minors to be transported across state lines for sexual mutilation. Can you believe this? We talked about it before. Can you believe we have to say this? And we will prosecute those involved in this sick California scheme for violating federal laws against kidnapping, sex, sex trafficking. It's really sex trafficking, child abuse, and a deprivation of civil rights. What they're doing is not even, they undid that. I will once again appoint rock solid conservative judges in the mold of justices Antonin Scalia, Samuel Alito, he's done a fantastic job, and the great Clarence Thomas, he's been fantastic. I will fully uphold the Second Amendment. I will, which is a big deal, four years. It was upheld, but they're doing all sorts. They're really fighting it very hard, and a weak person in office will lose it. I will bring back free speech in America, and I will secure the integrity of our elections. We have to do it. These things, and this is what we must do to restore our country to greatness again. The USA is a mess. Our economy is crashing. Inflation is totally out of control. China, Russia, Iran, and North Korea formed together in a menacing and destructive coalition. Very, very dangerous. Our currency is crashing and will soon no longer be the world standard, which will be our greatest defeat in 200 years if that happens. If that happens, it will be our single greatest defeat. But it won't happen with me, not even a chance. Just like Russia would never have invaded Ukraine and China would not even be thinking about talking, raiding Taiwan. I spoke to President Xi. He was never going to do it. He's only doing it or may do it now because he has no respect for this administration. He has no respect for Biden. And we would have left Afghanistan with dignity and strength. We were leaving Afghanistan. I got it down to 2,500 soldiers, which is the lowest number in many, many years. But we were going to keep Bagram because that air base is one hour away from where China, forget Afghanistan, where China makes their nuclear weapons. One hour, a biggest, one of the biggest air bases in the world. And we fled almost like in retreat, almost like a surrender. And we left Bagram. And you know who's occupying Bagram right now? China. China's occupying it. We built it, cost a fortune to build. Biggest, most powerful runways they can hold. I think they're eight feet thick of concrete. Twenty. I've been in finance since 1980. I do like investments. 
I invest in businesses quite a lot. We first considered investing in gold when we were still very concerned about the global economy, Europe in particular. I mean, clearly we're living in a time of unprecedented uncertainty. My criteria for looking for gold brokers was good market positioning, who also allowed me to invest through my SIP. I was looking above all with somebody I could trust. The market was full of transactional websites that really lacked that consultative approach. The other bullion dealers didn't want to engage with offering any help. The Pure Gold Company is an investment company that specialise in physical gold and silver, both coins and bars. They were very consultative in their, in their style with me. I made Josh jump through a large number of hoops. He managed to address all concerns that I was totally satisfied. One of my first things that I did was to download the investor guide, which helped me make up my mind. It was nice to read that there was a very flexible buyback facility. To my surprise and delight, there was going to be no capital to gain tax. I was never pushed until I was happy to go ahead with what I believed to be the right decision for our family. I thought the very reasonable pricing at the end of the day. It was really efficient. They took it out of my hands, put it all together, arranged the storage, all the documentation. It was really easy to do. Going through the whole process of consultation, getting your certificates, was all very orderly. I took the opportunity and it turned out very well for me. The better our clients do, the better we do in terms of our reputation. And the more our clients see us in the top tier publications like the Wall Street Journal, the Times, the Telegraph, the Guardian. We were on CNBC quite recently. Friendly, professional, trustworthy. It's allowing you that freedom to go out and play. The best form of security that I can have. I definitely will work with them again without a hesitation. I'm so glad I did what I did. We want to be able to pass it on to the children, the grandchildren in perpetuity. It's for tomorrow and the next. When people are asked on surveys, what's the number one reason for failure? Do you know what they say? Because it isn't lack of money or opportunity. It's always things like self-sabotage, procrastination, getting in my own way, having limiting beliefs. But how do you get rid of that? Because we were never taught that at school. Well, my name's Peter Sage. I'm an expert on human behavior with books published in multiple languages all over the world. And I'm here to tell you that I have the secret that you've been looking for. I can eradicate self-sabotage and procrastination in one hour if you give me your attention, I will give you the world's best training on this because it is so valuable that you learn to get out of your own way so you can deal with all the other stuff that's coming at you. And I'm gonna invite you to register for this incredible training where we're gonna spend an hour together completely free. And if you don't think this is the best training that you have ever had in your life, then guess what? I will give you a $100 gift just as a thank you for showing up. Now, I can't say fairer than that, so please click the button below and register for this training. Watch the little pre-training video because it's gonna get you ready for what is gonna be an incredible experience where you finally level up, learn how to earn more money, how to attract better opportunities, how to walk your talk, live your potential and claim the life that you really deserve without ever being bothered again by procrastination, self-sabotage or limiting beliefs. Click the button now and I promise you, this is gonna blow your mind. Thousand feet long, which is double a long runway. And we fled, we fled. Instead, I think, really, this is our greatest embarrassment in history, and a lot of bad things happened because of it. If you took the five worst presidents in the history of the United States and added them up, they would not have done the destruction to our country that crooked Joe Biden and the Biden administration have done in just a few short years, three years. We are a failing nation. We are a nation in decline. And, by the way, those are two phrases that Ron de Sanctimonious uses all the time. Do you notice? He says, we are a failing nation. We are a nation at line. Now, they're pretty unique statements, but he uses them all the time. And you know what? He can use them because he also throws hats. Do you notice the hats? He's throwing hats. And he does it the same way. He gets low and he flicks his wrist like that. And we don't like these copycats, do we? It's crazy. You know, I don't do the hat thing anymore because I don't want to. I watch him and say, Ugh. But 
It is true. We are a failing nation, and we are a nation in decline. And it's really a very sad thing to have to say, but it's obvious. And now these radical left lunatics want to interfere with our elections by using law enforcement at a level that they've never done before. Our nation is being challenged like never before. And yet, I stand here tonight confident that America can and will overcome it all by the strength of our faith, the power of prayer, and the grace of Almighty God. And many political people will not say those words. They will not say those words. In their group, if they say those words, they'll be taken to the shed. We're going to we're going to proudly say those words. And frankly, that's one of the problems our nation has: is it's gone the opposite and the opposite direction. There is nothing we cannot do as long as we hold fast to the timeless words of our national motto: "In God We Trust." So, with your help. And your prayers and your vote, we will stand up for the women of America. We will put America first, and we will, without question, make America great again, greater than ever before. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Have a good time. Thank you. Great. Thank you. The women of Concerned Women for America would love to just quickly say a prayer over with you. Would that be okay? If you'd like to join me, lift your palms up to the Lord and join me in prayer for this president. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we live in a nation where we get to choose our leaders. Thank you, God, for giving us a president that was willing to do the hard thing, to make America strong, to make our military great again, to support innocent life. God, I pray that you will continue to bless America. And God, I pray for President Trump. I pray that you will keep him safe. I pray that you will surround his family with angel armies and keep them safe from those who wish to harm them, even those that wish to hurt his children, God. I pray for them at this moment. God, First Peter tells us, to humble ourselves into the mighty hand of God. And he will lift us up in due season to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us. God, I pray that President Trump will feel cared for. I pray that he will be able to cast his cares on God. And I pray, Lord, that you will fill him with peace, fill him with joy, Lord, and continue to help him to feel resolute in protecting, in protecting America. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.